This is Duke University. So um, I decided to use this opportunity uh, to think about kind of the challenges of, of this new era of interdisciplinary work, uh, work uh, to think about a, um, a difficult moment in my own research that I uh, came across as a graduate student and as a postdoc, um, and that is working with um, animal cell culture. And it's something that I've wanted to return to several times, but I really did take the opportunity to think about this work um, because of this invitation. So, uh, oh, this has to register. Okay. So uh, when I began my, um, my research in uh, reproductive neuroendocrinology, um, I thought that I would uh, you know, walk in during my interview, actually, and uh, tell my uh, prospective PhD supervisor that I was going to do reproductive physiology work, but not using animals. And you know, I, I knew that that was going to be a difficult thing to do. For those of you who know about the field and animal behavior, to say that you're going to do this kind of research and not use animals, you know, they think you're coming from somewhere um, that doesn't belong. <laughs> and so, uh, but this PhD supervisor of mine actually was very. Um, uh, you know, open to this and also wanting to work with the in vitro cell line of neurons that had just kind of um, been put together. So I, I decided to talk a little bit about this process because it is a really intimate part of my work. And so um, the cell lines that I worked with, they, they were in vitro neuronal cell lines uh, derived from the hypothalamus of a mouse, and they were created through this uh, method of targeted tumorogenesis. So um, what happened basically is that they in introduced an oncogene into uh, a, a gene that coded for a, a hormone produced in the hypothalamus, GnRH. And so whenever that hormone was going to be produced, there would also be this oncogene being produced and um, feeding to a tumor. So they were able to excise a tumor from the hypothalamus of the mouse who had been designed in this way. And those neurons not only secreted GnRH, the hormone I was interested in looking at, but they grew like, a can like cancer cells. So this is how you can study uh, in vitro neuronal cell line. So uh, you know, making that decision to uh, you know not do animal research was for me at the time a really big step in the type of politics I wanted to bring into the science that I was doing. But I soon realized that you know uh, it might not be whole animals that I'm sacrificing or killing in my work, but that these are now cells that I work with on a day everyday basis. And so um, you know, these were the neurons that I. I worked closely with. And um, in the beginning of my piece, I talk about you know, what got me into the lab in the first place. And so this was um, Toronto. And uh, I know, Bradley, you spent some time there. So uh, you'll, you know, there's a very lefty vibe in the University of Toronto. And so there's a, the woman's bookstore right across the street. And um, so as I was uh, thinking of continuing in the sciences, uh, there were always, you know, protests going on, and at the time, this is like the early 90s or so, RU486 was, you know, something that everybody was thinking about. Um, and so as, you know, my friends and colleagues were also going into the streets, I was taking uh, what I thought was my, you know, my activism and trying to go into the lab and to uh, think about doing science as my feminism. So, um, so what I've decided to kind of share today is um, what ha, what that journey has kind of been about a little bit, and some of the questions that uh, that linger for me. So over the last decade, I've been fortunate enough to find a space within the field of women's studies to carry that pause that I had um, while I was working with these in vitro neurons. And one day, I really actually uh, did have this pause where um, I was about to bring these neurons outside of an incubator, and they, I knew they were going to be, you know, they were warm in there, and I was going to shock them and then kill them and, you know, get their proteins. So then I thought, what am I about to do? So that that has that's the pause that's remained with me. Um, so. 
this field has allowed me to carry that pause uh, along and begin articulating that moment in molecular biology um, as a meaningful event worth further examination. Beginning with counter-responses to biological determinism, to analyses of sex, gender, class, race, and more in scientific research, to critiques of objectivity, to theories of feminist embodiment bolstered by health activism, women's, health, women's studies has had a long-standing relationship with the sciences and has even produced the subfield of feminist technoscience studies, which I'll be talking about more today. Um, as an invested onlooker, however, I have witnessed a significant shift not only within the subfield with regards to its relationship with the sciences, but more generally, um, also in the larger field of women's studies itself. In what may be connected to fallout from the science wars, women's studies, along with many other humanities disciplines, is currently undergoing significant theoretical shifts in an attempt to reorient itself in relation to the sciences. Wrestling with the impacts of ontological, posthumanist, and material turns, recent theoretical gestures in the subfield of feminist technoscience studies serves as, as an example of the magnitude of these reorientations. The critique of poststructuralism's influence on feminist theory and its apparent inability to deal with matter in and of itself has brought forward calls for developing new types of engagements with materiality, namely through scholarship in material feminisms, um, and feminist new materialisms. These calls, would also, uh, calls have also brought with them what I would suggest is an era of rejuvenate, rejuvenated regard for the sciences, from the development of in-depth critiques of gendered language and paradigms in science, to now mining scientific research and data in efforts to move feminist theory forward, there has undoubtedly been a significant shift in the tide within the culture of women's studies with regards to the sciences. This shift reflects what the organizers of this seminar have described as a new era of interdisciplinary exchange between the humanities and sciences. Having placed questions central to the humanities in exchange with research and progress in the natural sciences and digital technologies, this new era of interdisciplinarity has made the question that I posed that day in the lab about the fate of these cells and what their response would be if they knew I was about to take them out of this warm incubator, um, somewhat has made this question more recognizable, not only to fellow humanities scholars, but also to projects emerging out of neuroscience, genetics, and the sciences. So um, I want to go on to uh, talking about the challenges that I see uh, ahead, at least for the field of women's studies specifically, but maybe it's also there's a more general application here. Um, so in this piece, I want to argue that increased exchange between the humanities and the sciences has precipitated three major productive challenges for humanities-based disciplines. Firstly, just as an earlier wave of interdisciplinary work in the humanities forced us to examine the social and political context of the question what it means to be human through multiple different and inevitably intersecting frames of sex, gender, race, class, sexuality, and more, I believe that as a result of new exchanges with the sciences, the next generation of interdisciplinary humanities scholarship is attempting to trouble the central premise of this very question. Next generation humanities scholars are not simply exposing themselves and working hard to train in new fields of exchange such as with the natural sciences and digital technologies only to find newer ways to understand the human condition. Rather, what I want to argue is that new alliances between the natural sciences and fields such as women's studies, for instance, have in fact attempted to decentralize the question of the human in the humanities. Sustained entanglements with animal behavior research, evolutionary biology, molecular genetics, quantum physics, and more have complicated our understandings of exactly which lives get to count and constitute our concerns over expressive life. The growth and popularity of humanities-based inquiry in posthumanism and animal studies are indications of this paradigm shift. In the field of women's studies alone, for example, we are now facing questions of the human and non-human, the living and the dead, and the organic and inorganic through the theoretical frameworks, such as Donna Haraway's idea of nature cultures, Karen Brad's theory of agential realism, Jane Bennett's use of vibrancy, and more recently, Mel Chen's notion of animacy, to name but a few. 
From these recent theoretical mur moorings, a question that seems important to address then when considering the future of the humanities in this new era, era of interdisciplinary work is not only whether established methodologies or disciplinary paradigms will support new ways of asking what it means to be human, but also whether humanity <coughs> scholars, paradigms, and methodologies are prepared to support the new interdisciplinary call to question what it means to be non-human. The second challenge for the humanities that I spell out arises from this um, interdisciplinary exchange. Is It's a result of this first challenge. As all eyes turn to the non-human and to molecules and subatomic matter, we must remain aware of the costs of building theoretical interventions apart from their social and political implications. Our ideas of the social and political can expand so as to include or even focus upon the non-human. But as we change the nature of a central question of the humanities, we must also keep in mind the broader context and repercussions of our work. So while I'm going to argue that the new era of interdisciplinary uh, um, work is going to demand that the humanities-based disciplines must undergo this kind of major paradigm-shifting work, um, I will also argue that this shift must simultaneously be accompanied by the social and political frameworks of analysis which paid attention to issues of sex, race, gender, class, and more that were developed during that first era and wave of interdisciplinarity. In my opinion, it's a sign of good interdisciplinary work when um, not just humanity scholars remember to bring earlier frameworks of analysis with them, but also when scientists make the effort and take the time to learn to use crucial methodologies developed in the humanities. Far from becoming obsolescent, I would argue that at least in the case of women's studies and emerging debates regarding ontological posthumanists and material turns in feminist theory, we dis desperately need to carry first generation humanities toolkits with us along for an even more difficult task ahead. And this brings me to the third uh, challenge that I describe. And it's um, particularly relevant to the um, field of women's studies. This is the challenge that requires us not to stop once we have initiate, initiated our ontological posthumanist and material turns, but rather requires us to keep theorizing our way through until we can use these new insights in our quest for non-human and human social justice. In her work on Darwin, feminism, and sexual difference, for example, Elizabeth Gross uh, asks us to consider the following. How does biology, the structure and organization of living systems, facilitate and make possible cultural existence and social change? As a biologist, I'm on board with the idea that biology can be used to initiate social change. This is why a partial agonist of the progesterone receptor, RU486, made me enter into the lab in the first place. I am committed to what feminists can come to know, not just by collaborating with the sciences, but also by collaborating with matter and molecules. I'm invested in the futures that we can begin to imagine, particularly by turning to biology. However, I also think that much about what we come to know and the future that we want to see depends on the specificity of the social change we are talking about. Turning to the lives of non-humans, genes, atoms, and matter also requires us to address questions of Time, uh, context, time, and responsibility. For example, in her work on Bohr, Einstein, Heisenberg, and quantum physics, Brad draws from Derrida's idea of justice to come to discuss entanglements and the behavior of atoms. She states, the past is never closed, never finished once and for all, but there is no taking it back, setting time aright, putting the world back on its axis. The trace of all reconfiguration, reconfigurings are written into the unfolded materializations of what is to come. Time can't be fixed. To address the past and future, to speak with ghosts is not to entertain or reconstruct some narrative of the way it was, but to respond, to be responsible, to take responsibility for that which we inherit from the past and the future, for the entangled re relationalities of inheritance that we are, only in this ongoing responsibility to the entangled other, without dismissal, is there the possibility of justice to come." End of quote. So while Gross uh, encourages us to think differently with the sciences to imagine biology and nature as providing the grounds for social change, Brad emphasizes the importance of thinking about our responsibility while we work to think differently about materiality. 
uh, Jill Jagger, I think that's how you pronounce her first name, has recently argued that uh, compared to Brad's theory of agential realism, Gross's turn to nature falls short of providing a useful way of rethinking materiality. She states, this is uh, Jagger, thus if the aim of the new materialism is to provide a way of rethinking the interimplication of culture and nature, moving away from the negation of one in the determination of the other, difficulties remain in both um, Kirby and Gross accounts. This is not the case, however, with Barad's account of the interaction of nature and culture in the material discursive relation. It involves a process of mutual articulation that is a matter of interimplication." End of quote. So I would argue that um, both Gross and Barad in their own ways are encouraging us to find our way through science, biology, physics, molecules, and matter, develop what we learn from our entanglements into what I'm calling molecular politics here, and then return once more to our commitments to social change and justice. Just how to accomplish this remains equally difficult regardless of the approach we take. And I take up the intricacies of this third challenge in um, the rest of my paper. How am I doing for time? Um, Okay. All right. Well, um, in that case, I'll just uh, share what I have here. Um, so in the paper, I do a very close reading of um, a work by Vicki Kirby. Um, and it's a, 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 a work that she uh, has appeared several times in her writing, where she talks about um, bacteria's capability to write. And she, you know, she says that uh, she asked, what if culture was really nature all along? And she suggests that life itself is creative encryption. And uh, specifically, Specifically, she targets bacteria, um, talking about their, um, their co code cracking uh, capabilities uh, and to think of bacteria as cryptographers. So um, uh, she makes the claim here uh, that it is in the nature of nature to write, to read, and to model. And so um, although I'm very interested in this kind of uh, uh, ontological reorientation and this post-humanist gesture, um, a concern comes up, and that I think is from the context of feminist technoscience studies that I'm coming from, and also from um, uh, women's health activism, is that what happens when we make these kind of ontological claims that you know bacteria, for example, can now write. And so uh, I describe in the rest of the paper that you know the that feminist technoscience studies that has been influenced by social justice epolo uh, epistemologies and frameworks would ask simple questions, actually, that I think are important to put into conversation with this kind of theoretical intervention. So what is the context in which bacteria are granted the skill to write? What happens when a notion of language is extended to nature? And what are the specific interactions and material consequences of this maneuvering? And I'm thinking specifically of um, the example of synthetic biology. And that's where I would, you know, I, uh, the title of my talk is something about molecular politics. And I realized that that's what I left <laughs> unwritten and unspoken really in this paper. So uh, I'm thinking here about synthetic biology and the minimal genome. So how many of you have heard of the minimal genome? Okay, so just very quickly, um, so bacteria have, um, their genome is in a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid. And um, uh, there is a bacteria that has a very small plasmid genome. Uh, something like 50,000 base pairs. So what synthetic biologists have done is taken this smallish uh, genome and they've decided to cut, start cutting out pieces of genes and, or genes altogether from the genome to decide what is the minimal amount of genes and base pairs you need for this uh, genome to replicate, right, to, to reproduce. And so they have taken that down to 5,000 base pairs and they say, okay, this is what you need in order for reproduction to occur. And now you can insert what kind of genes of interest you're interested in. You want something to smell like bananas? Put in a gene for banana smell. And then you can rebuild uh, the genome. So to me, uh, the question to say that you know, um, bacteria write has implications in the field like synthetic biology where we are using bacteria's writing skills um, in order to, you know, harness what we are going to say, you know, biofuels for the future, bi biomedical remediation, and all kinds of things. So uh, these have implications. And um, I end here with this idea that what feminist technoscience has taught us is that if you're going to talk about bacteria, you know, you got to smell it. you gotta, you got to get in there and you got to do that work to know that intimate relationship with these organisms. And uh, this is, you know, a slide I like to put on. <laughs> Thank you. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.